So thanks for coming tonight. Thank you for teaching. Thank you for teaching. You're welcome. Kevin is going to intervene in the work stuff, so he's not here tonight. And Diana, it's going to get better. Well, I think she's going to now. Yeah, because it's been quite a while. Mm. Quite a while. Well, with Mitch, yeah, it went on for five, so five right? weeks. It was five weeks with Mitch. He sounded like death. Really? Yeah, <coughs> really sick. Really sick. Did you get pneumonia? No. Just really bad cold. Sounds like bronchitis or something. Oh. I mean, the way she's coughing. Yeah. This is so beautiful. <laughs> so. Bodhisattva's Way of Life, Part 2, and it's on how to develop the clever. So let's get started with some prayers. Let's do English, Craig. <laughs> Is it easier in Tibetan? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Here is the great earth. Filled with the smell of incense, covered with delicate flowers, the great mountains, the four continents, wearing the jewel of the sun and moon, in the mind that made them the paradise of the Buddha, and offer it all to you. I esteem every living being who experienced the pure world. Even Guru Ratna Mandal would come here in the town. I go for refuge to the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha until I achieve enlightenment by the power of the goodness that I do in giving them your rest. May I reach Buddha for the sake of every living being. I go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I achieve enlightenment by the power of the goodness that I do in teaching them rest. May I reach Buddha for the sake of every living being. I go for refuge to Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha until I achieve enlightenment by the power of the goodness that I do and the teaching rest. May I reach Buddha for the sake of every living being. You want to get out um, your homework and reading, have it handy, would be great. And um, how's everybody doing tonight? Okay. Yeah? Okay. Oh no. I'm sorry to hear that. Did you take anything? I don't usually get headaches, so it's not usually an issue. Between work and the other. I'm sorry. Rosemary, if I was in my office, I'd give you some rosemary oil to put on mm. the forehead because <laughs> that can be helpful to some people for headache. Sure. Um, <coughs> so, do you want to exchange homework, those that can? Okay, is that everybody? <laughs> <laughs> I, we have an arrangement though. You have an arrangement, okay. Diana's not here, who so I do it with. So. Okay. So, we're what did the meditations go last week? What were you going to say, Bonnie? I just said, we're doing it. We're doing it, good. <laughs> Terrific. Um, 
how did the because I know it's the continuing same meditation um, on what um, let's see. Yeah, where it really comes from, the true source. It's been it's been great uh, because I've been thinking about causality in other in other situations. And so it's been it's a good reminder. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, because I was surprised. I've been you know I look at the homework before every class and I was surprised they're doing it again, but then I wasn't because. I mean, how many, how many emptiness meditations can you do? <laughs> <laughs> and how much work does any one person need to do on anger? Mm -hmm. So, I'm going to speak for myself, I guess. Um, so, uh, we're going to continue the fourth perfection, joyful ever, or virya in Sanskrit, this evening. And the subtitle... The title of this class is How to Develop Joyful Effort, but the subtitle is How Not to Get Discouraged. So we'll be talking about that as well. Um, so in Sanskrit, there's another word, um, vira, V-I-R-A, that's related to virya, and it means hero. And I just was thinking of that and thinking about the write-up that I think Bob and Judith did for this class talking about superheroes. And um, so that, you know, that's what Bodhisattvas strive for is being a, a spiritual superhero um, with Virya. So, um, and another Sanskrit word that I was thinking of because we're going over the, the perfections is um, Paramita. That's the word for perfection in Sanskrit. And it means, it actually means gone beyond or crossed over. So um, this the sense of that is that it's having crossed over to the place where there's no more mental afflictions, to, to enlightenment, to the clear light, to Buddhahood. So there's no suffering, and you're in a Buddha paradise when you cross over. And all is good. So this is this is what we're practicing for. That's why we need the joyful effort to practice all of the um, perfections and um, just as a reminder, if you like, the sound of enlightenment for the sake of all living beings or bodhicitta. Just a reminder that the six perfections are the way to get there, not individually the six perfections, but collectively the six. So um, I want to turn to the reading on page 80. Um, Bonnie, can you read? Sure. <clears throat> Never feel discouraged. Assemble the forces. Engage yourself gladly. Come to find complete command of yourself. See yourself and other people as equal and find ex finally exchange yourself and others as well. So um, this is the first reference that I've heard of, I think, in all the classes of exchanging self and others. And I just remembered that I was going to bring Lum Christie's book to do that, to do that meditation, mm -hmm. and I didn't. So let's see if we have time, and I'll wing it. Um, so, going to question one, um, Janet, can you read it? Name and describe the four types of effort that are needed by warrior bodhisattvas like the four armed forces of a king in ancient India. So, bodhisattvas are also known as warrior saints because um, of the battles that they do against mental afflictions. So, this reference to um, the four types of effort actually has its um, its roots in the traditional four fo forces of a king, which Geshe Michael includes in this. And the, I don't believe it's on the homework, but just so you know that the four forces of a king 
were elephanteers, charioteers, cavalry, and infantry. And so this was a kind of a factual listing of how they approached, you know, the military at that point. I mean, now it would be drones and tanks and aircraft carriers and missiles and things like that. Um, um, as the weapons used to defend against attacks. And um, for the, the bodhisattva, the attacks are the mental affliction attacks. And um, so, and they, you know, and they lead to discouragement. So that's why we need the four types of effort. Um, so, a bodhisattva uses these four types, and we need them. We need to understand them and apply them, um, develop them. If we, some are some are easily attainable, and some of them need development. Depends on the person and their karma. Um, so the first one is armor effort, and it's the kind where you never you're never discouraged from your practice of the path. So it's it's um, in one sense it's a bodhisattva attitude. The hero never getting discouraged, and the main tool um, against this or for this is um, bodhicitta. You know, to help us remember when things don't go our way, why we're doing it. So, you know, there's guaranteed to be hard times because we're not there yet. Um, you know, and some people may ask, why am I not enlightened? It's been three months. <laughs> you know, I've been working hard for three months. But Lanaji says that it's. 5, 10, 15 years until enlightenment. Um, and that's if we practice faithfully daily, keeping our vows and, and, our, and our bolstering our bodhicitta. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a long term process, it's a path. That's actually yeah. helpful. <laughs> well, no, I, I think you were going to say short, but it's, it's that too. But sometimes I just find reading all of this, it's like, it's so much, you just feel like mm -hmm. so far from it, <laughs> you know, so it helps to know that it's not something you're supposed to be able to just do right away. <laughs> right. Oh, uh, yeah. No. Super bodies. Well, huh, Janet? That's what you're aiming for. I'm going to get some spandex in the cave. My nose above water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, according to this, you, you're doing better than that. So, um, So this is why this the book is called The Bodhisattva's Way of Life, because he's explaining to us, you know, level by level and inch by inch how to do it. And um, and how in this instance how to keep our courage up, not get discouraged. So in doing our bodhisattva activities, we're not just going to help people by feeding them, like at the open door, or um, giving them money or material things, um, or giving them a ride, or serving them when they're sick, or things like that. We're not just going to do that. You know, we're going to do that, but we're also going to um, do it to gather the merit in order to reach full enlightenment for ourselves, so that we will become omniscient and we'll be able to know, as a Buddha, what they need to do for them. What, what they need us, what they need that we could help them with. And so, um, it's, you know, it goes beyond like a good, a good deed of giving a homeless person a dollar or something like that. It goes way beyond that. Um, And, you know, I'm not saying anything negative about those activities because they're great activities and they're going to they're gonna really help and um, 
and um, help you gather merit. And but it's to do it with the um, the bodhicitta in your heart and in your mind, which is I find very hard to do. Mm. I know what I'm trying to do all day, but I don't remember why I'm doing it. Um, so I haven't got a trick. If anybody has any mental trick or something to do that, I, I know I know that I need to work on that personally. Um, so, and the book is a big help because you can even make a check off in your book for, you know, brought up bodhicitta, brought up bodhicitta, brought up bodhicitta, because it's amazing how much stuff you can fit in the margins on a page of the book <laughs> when you try. Um, so that's something I'm going to try. Um, so just doing the small deeds without the bodhicitta aim, you know, in your heart and in your mind, is just going to leave their sufferings temporarily, but it's not going to do anything to get them to enlightenment necessarily. So, and the, the permanent, the help towards the permanent alleviation from their suffering is something that we can only do when we've reached it ourselves, um, when we reach total enlightenment ourselves, and um, can fully understand what it is they need, as I said, through the omniscience, and how to be of true help to them. Um, so, a little bit on karma, and on um, gathering merit. Um, what does what does karma say? Is the is the way to get yourself to the airport for your flight? Drive somebody else to the airport. That's a good one. What did you say? Oh, same thing. Same thing. How about you? Well, you don't have to give somebody a ride to the airport, but you could certainly give somebody transportation. Yep. Um, well, the, 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 all of those are true. All of those are very true. Um, but I was thinking more along the lines of speeding and cutting people off. And, you mean um, a way not to get there? <laughs> well, what? you know, well, a lot of people, you go to the, go to the, head to the airport and see the way people drive and you know they're late for their flight or they're potentially late for their flight and um, they're not driving so nicely and um, it's that's not what's going to get you there it's it's um, letting other people go first so slowing down and um, you know letting letting other letting the person get in front of you um, changing lanes so what's the proof that um, the, that's say speeding and cutting people off is not the um, not the reason that you would get to the airport on time. This is kind of a debatey question. Mm -hmm. Well, because you might speed and cut people off and not get there. I mean. Your car right, because you won't always get there mm -hmm. like that. I mean, sometimes you could stop and get ticketed. Um, you can get into an accident driving so um, recklessly. Um, sometimes you will get almost there and you run into a detour and miss it. So it's not the cause, because if it was the cause, it would always get you to the airport on time and to make your flight. Um, you could even get there on time and say, ah, I put this does work, and then have your flight canceled. So, you know, and I think most of us have been there with something like that at the airport. Um, so, and sometimes when you do drive the speed limit and you make all the green lights and you do get there on time, proofs again that you don't need to speed and cut people off to get there. So um, our, Bodhi, uh, our Bodhisattva aim 
is to always help others and put them first. So um, to serve and to let other goes first, let others go first. Um, so it may not get to the to the plane on time, but neither will speeding and cutting people off or telling somebody you can't take them to the airport, that it's just too much trouble to pick them up on your way. Um, so karma says, um, it will be the cause in the future of making the plane or something bigger because karma grows. So doing the good deeds and say you don't get there on time and you do, um, you've still done the good deed and you're still planting the seed. And the seed that is flowering then for you not to have made the plane has nothing to do with it, as you all know. It has something to do from the past. Maybe when you were speeding another time to get to the airport and cutting people off. So, um, so it's all of these activities are going to guarantee happiness in the future. All the bodhisattva activities. The armor effort is thinking, I've got nothing to lose, and I'm just going to go for it. Um, you know what isn't working, and you know um, you real you realize that trying something new is the only viable thing to do. So you know it has to do with renunciation as well. Um, and Lamaji talks about Thelma and Louise renunciation, which they're they're running from the law and they're approaching they don't realize it but they're approaching a big canyon um and they they suddenly realize they're at the the canyon edge practically and they look behind and there's nothing but cop cars so they realize that um there's nothing behind for, that was of any use to them that was going to um, help them in any way. So as Lamaji would say, they floored the freaking Thunderbird. So no holds barred. And that's what armor effort is like. They went forward because um, it was the only alternative that made sense logically. Because what was going to be behind them was going to be nothing but pain and suffering. So, um, using armor effort will help you floor the Thunderbird into your practice. Um, you know, without question, without looking around for other um, other methods that aren't going to work so well. And will take longer. I mean, so this is about the speed at which we can we can reach enlightenment. So the next effort that we're going to cover is working effort, and that's the effort where you make where you make effort to amass the two collections, which are merit and wisdom. And you need the other five perfections to collect them as well but it's in combination with joyful effort that you joyfully give, you joyfully behave ethically, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that, the, the, the using it with giving ethical behavior and patience, using the joyful effort, that will give you the collection of merit, as we talked about last week, and joyfully meditating, um, to realize ultimate reality and gain wisdom as um, is what brings us um, wisdom. So um, so we need to think about emptiness more in order to, to um, access the Buddha mind that we will have in the future. So bodhisattvahood is not just being nice. It's not just being, you know, 
likable and admired and um, and and just being a goody two shoes. It's really the the bodhicitta, remembering the goal. That is what it's all about. So, you know, as you develop in your practice, you may start changing how you express this bodhicitta, how you um, go about creating good karma and, and gaining merit, I should say, and um, doing doing things so that you're evaluating what you're going to do so that you can, um, you know, it's a, Lamaji says that, you know, I, is enlightenment sudden or is it gradual? Is it sudden or is it gradual? And he would describe it as being um, gradual and then sudden. So if we're practicing up to know what the best thing is for another living being in order to help them get enlightened, we can start as bodhisattvas to, um, you know, you're not going to change another person's karma. But if you um, if you have two different things you could do for them, you might want to examine which one is going to be more towards their spiritual development, like giving money or giving food to someone who is um, is homeless, or um, I'm trying to think of some other examples. But if you think through what your activities are going to be, you may find that there's a higher thing that you could do for the person, you know. And it's if you can, yeah, it's more meritorious for you, but you're actually starting to help the person reach enlightenment instead of just feeding their body or or something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so as a bodhisattva, we've got that specific goal to perfect ourselves. So, um, for the sake of others, and it's much more than being nice, because being nice is not enough. You know, it's pleasant, and you'll be happy in the moment, but you're not going to bring yourself or others, you know, permanent happiness through um, the, through, through just being nice. Um, so the third kind of effort is engaged effort. Um, and that is the one that we work to, um, to, with which we work to maintain both recollection and awareness. So recollection is parenthetically of the wish, um, uh, recollection of the wish or remembering the goal. Um, and that's what we do while performing all our virtuous deeds. So, you know, it's, it's remembering the goal and having it at the forefront of our minds and in our hearts. And then the second under-engaged effort is awareness. Um, and that's like an internal alarm so that when you forget recollection, so that you, it's your backup plan. Um, so it's the actual remembering, um, the recollection is, and you develop awareness um, to the part of your mind that checks in to see if you're watching your P's and Q's, you know, and why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and it's somewhat like the peripheral awareness that Master Chuladasa talks about, that you developed. So um, 
you start to notice your state of mind and the decisions you're making moment to moment. You remember what you're doing and why. You remember your bodhicitta. Um, you start to develop a meditative state of mind for the whole day as you develop this. And you think about wisdom, ultimate reality. That comes in frequently. And you notice you haven't been, you know, you notice when you don't take the bodhisattva opportunities. Like I wasn't just, I wasn't generous in that moment. I could have, I could have done something for that person or given that person something, or I could have let that car come out, and I didn't. So you start to observe, you know, kind of when you're mentally off duty from bodhicitta, <laughs> and bring yourself back um, to it so that it's a constant practice. Um, so you're, it means that you're engaged all day long. So um, it's, this is very important. All these are very important, but that, that one um, is, you know, without, I feel like without engagement, you're not gonna, you, you're just going to be going through the motions and you really need to be um, hooked in and committed. So the fourth one is called self-command. And that one is being able to get your body and your mind to do any virtuous activities that you wish and to do them well. And this is, this is brought to you by constant practice. So um, it's, it's to be habituated. So some have and some don't, but it's something that one can learn. Some people just kind of are good at this. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Maybe yeah. a question. I don't know, but it's... Um, is the, the Bodhisattva way of life, of the, the, the tax itself, the, the, um, is that the first thing that's taught to aspire to, like as a beginning Buddhist, <laughs> or is it a more advanced thing? Well, have you done seven? No. Okay, that's the Bodhisattva vows. So you haven't taken Bodhisattva vows. <laughs> okay, well... No, but I'm, just, that's that's just it. It's just you know. In, yeah. I mean, I'm sort of hearing whatever is being offered, you know. But I'm finding that it's, you know, it just feels like it's a million miles from where I am, <laughs> and I think it's I'm happy to hear it to know what to aim toward. But I'm just wondering if it's, you know, if it's um, a good place for I a understand. beginner, or if it's, you know, if it's going to just make me feel like I'm never going to make it. You know, well, you need some armor. Effort. I know. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And some engaged at her. No, I can There's understand so much. That. I feel like, oh my God, I'm just trying to get vegetables, and that's about all. You know, and <laughs> that's you what know. you're instructed to do, though. I know, but but there's so much else yeah. to it, and I'm like, uh, uh, you know, I feel like maybe I should come back to this in a few years or something. I don't, you know, I don't. Well, I don't. you can. I would encourage you to continue with it. And just take it, take in what you can. And um, maybe, I don't know, are you taking 16? Is that the next one? That that's what Mary Kay's doing. I don't know, I just saw the email like, right before All right. came, so I don't know. Because you might like, want to, if that's hard. not, because that is reviewing classes one through five. Mm -hmm. Have you? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a great idea. It, so well, it's, well, well, no, that's not what I was going to say. That would be good. But you could also consider listening to the Bodhisattva's vows, class seven, mm. just listening to a few of them, so that you can, because it goes, does that go through all the vows? Yep. Yeah. It does? Yes. Okay, I couldn't Phil remember. Taught it. Yeah. Jesse taught it too. Yeah. And yeah. I actually, my girlfriend took it. Out. Yeah, there's, mm. m there's several teachers you can, you can listen to yeah. online. So even if you just like listen to the first class, and see if any of that, um, you know, 
because this sounds like it's a little rough on you, and that might be a little gentler. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I hope you'll continue with the class, but I think that um, not having done, did you do 10? Yeah. Okay. So you're good. I mean, I always well. like hearing it, and, and you know, but it's it's like the gap is growing wider between what what I know is out there now and what I'm actually able to do. It's just it feels like it's the gap is increasing. If you could do it all, the you'd more be I know enlightened like, now. Is, you know, if you could do it all right now, I can, I just, you'd be enlightened. I don't want to the, start I, small. I I took classes for about three years. I mean, I have well, I've taken almost every class, but it was about a year into it before I any of it made sense. Yeah. I mean, I took like course one with Rick. I didn't have a clue of what he was talking about. I took like millions of notes, and then when I went back to it two years later, it was like, oh, yeah. I don't understand okay. this now. It just it start. I, my experience is it starts to seep in. Yeah. But I do think it is helpful to take the earlier course, yeah. you know, it's because like it does build. Because yeah, so 15 good. might, so 16, 16 yeah. might be good because it's a review. Um, it's, yeah. Because it's a review of those earlier ones, yeah. it'll be like all crunch. That's what part. I did. Yeah. I took those very early on. And then everything, it became like, a, I would always visualize a web that would, you know, a nice web, not a creepy spider web. <laughs> but that the things, things would connect. Yeah. From all the classes, and I think the fact that I took those early actually helped me um, to have a some sort of um, you know nugget, you know, of what the class was about, so that when I took the class, it um, it was you know the expand expanded version mm -hmm. was, was really great, and I was ready for it. So. I think you also get used to the language after a while. Mm -hmm. You know, that I think at the beginning, it's so foreign and it doesn't make sense, but like warrior saints, like that phrase because it's in the uh, Heart Sutra, mm -hmm. you know, that you do over and over when somebody dies. So I mean, certain things start to click yeah. and you hear certain phrases and then you go, oh, I know that phrase mm -hmm. from there, or, yeah. you know. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. A little. Yeah. You are in very good company. Almost everybody. Yeah. You are. <laughs> yeah, really. Well, Do you know how much I have like to work to present this <laughs> material? Yeah. Because because it's been three years since I took the class, and mm -hmm. and so. You know, my retention is not what I'd like it to be. Um, mm -hmm. So I have to, you know, go over. So the point is that. Um, when you, th when you, I think when, that when you teach it, that's when you really learn it. Mm -hmm. I do, at least for me. Yeah. I mean, so 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 that's a ways off. So don't be so hard on yourself. No, I, I I get that, and I wasn't trying to be. It's just I I just. You're feeling a little well. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. We can all relate. Yeah. Right. All of us relate yeah. to that. Yeah. Every one of us. Every okay. single one of us. Every single one. Every single one of us. Has been or is or <laughs> or will be. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly will be. But I think it's something like you know blind faith. If you have trust in the teachers, you just breathe and say, okay, someday this will all make sense. Yeah. But if they're you know, if I trust that they're guiding me on the right path, then it'll at some point start to come together. There are some gentle aha moments to be had. Like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. okay, that makes sense now. You know, so look forward to. It. All right, thank you. Sure. Um. So for for self command, you need to set small goals if you if you need some you know help along these lines. So just set small goals like when we talk about doing the four forces for the um, restitution. So I'm not going to do X, Y, or Z for the next 15 minutes, hour day, whatever, but don't make it and never do it again. 
So it's the same kind of thing to set little goals for yourself so that you can accomplishment, accomplish them, like meditating for X number of minutes. Don't go beyond whatever minutes you know you can't go beyond, because then you have a failure on your docket. And you, what you want to do is to re-inhabit of doing, um, re rehabituate, excuse me, so that you do what you say you're going to do if you have any issues with, with sticking to what your plan is, so that you can, um, you know, measure progress in doing what you say you're going to do. So um, I feel like I'm not articulating that very well, but just you know, practice doing things and accomplishing them. Um, little by little, Shanai, Shanai, um, which I think is, is that how you spell that? That works for me. I'm constantly saying it to myself, Shanai, Shanai. Um, <coughs> I don't know, and I don't know whether it's Tibetan. Um, I think it's Sanskrit, but it could very well be Tibetan. Um, <coughs> so, <coughs> So make decisions to do small things. Um, and so, for instance, don't start out by saying, OK, I'm going to get up at 5 AM, I'm going to do yoga for an hour and a half, and then I'm going to sit for um, um, and, um, well, sit for an hour at 5, and do yoga for an hour and a half, and then have a vegan breakfast. If you stay up till midnight, if you can't meditate more than 20 minutes and uh, you don't have a yoga practice and that you eat bacon and you eat bacon and eggs every morning, don't load yourself up with that kind of a burden to try to do. If you want to, you know, do more yoga, sit longer, get up earlier, and eat better, um, don't do them all at once. Do <laughs> one little by little or a little tiny chunks of things. So, because um, otherwise you're setting yourself up for failure and you see yourself as a failure. Um, and you, you know, if you try to do too much, if you're anything like me, you'll put it off till tomorrow. And tomorrow never comes. So, um, let's go to um, the reading on page 82, I'm feeling discouraged. Who'd like to read? Glad I can read. Thanks. Never allow yourself the feeling of being discouraged or of having the thought, how could I ever become enlightened? About this, those who have gone thus, the ones who speak the truth, have spoken the following words of truth. Those beings who are flies and gnats, or bees, and even those who live as worms as well, can reach unmatched enlightenment, so difficult to reach, they develop the force of effort. So question... That's what we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. So, um... I'm a worm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who can read question two for me? I will. Thanks. Give a paraphrase of the verse where Master Shanti Deva gives us a reason why we should never feel discouraged in our search for enlightenment. What is the ultimate source of these lines? Okay. So um, this refers to those lines. Um, and I'll tell you what the what the ultimate source is because I, I don't know if it's in the reading straight out. Um, it's the sutra requested by Subahu, S U B A H U, and it's taught by Lord Buddha. So there's a story I heard from Lama Jesse that flies will fly around a stupa, like just fly round and round and round. And, um, and, and in doing so, they're gaining great merit. So even flies. Well, they're probably going clockwise. 
Why? Because that's the way you you go when you when you, you gain the on a retreat. You know, you you meditate going clockwise around a stupa. Well, he didn't mention about that, but oh, I bet. I would bet they would. So is it saying that that Nats can become enlightened as Nats? No. Okay, because I, no. I thought no. that was contradictory to what I heard before. No, and I, I realized that, that, work on that it. it may sound that way, so I was going to clarify that. That um, Lama Ji would remind us um, that you must be a human to get enlightened. So an insect needs to do a lot more work to come back as a human being than we have to do to reach enlightenment as humans. So we should, you know, get cracking. Don't want to come back as a, as a worm or a, a gnat. So, um, so insects and worms and things with virya can gain the merit to reach Buddhahood eventually. Um, so if you work your butt off happily, you will too. And that's, you know, where the uh, happily is where the joyful effort comes in. Um, and so, you know, if you're doing something and you're enjoying it and you're happy doing it, it doesn't feel like work. So that's the trick to, you know, to the, all this um, effort, this joyful effort, is to find a way to enjoy what you're doing. And it's also reprogramming your, your brain to enjoy doing what you know you should be doing because we do know what that is and um, not doing those things can potentially, and maybe I'm just talking to the Catholics in the room, former Catholics, but it can, it can develop into remorse, not doing those things, which is see, not seeing yourself as a, as a potential Buddha by seeing yourself as a loser. You know, so you, you really need to fight against that and that's, Remorse is not joyful effort. It's like the opposite of it. Um, so make it fun. It really should be fun because it's the ultimate cause of happiness is helping others. And if if flies get effort, you know they get it, then we really should. <laughs> so. Um, I just was thinking of something else about flies. Uh, it's like they can eat stuff that would kill us and survive on it, like, like peacocks can eat poison and turn it into beautiful feathers. So, um, So I want to go. I want to go to the stupa, the Krokula Center in the summer and see if there's flies flying around it now. <laughs> I really do. On a hot summer day, see if they're there. So um, the Bodhisattva vows, and not, you probably aren't aware of this, they last for all future lifetimes. They leave an impression on your mind stream that go with you, goes with you from life to life. Um, and they're very powerful. They're very powerful because bodhicitta is extremely powerful. Um, so um, I still would encourage you to give a listen to at least the first class, see what you think about that, because that in and of itself might attract you to doing it in case you're if you're considering doing the bodhisattva vows at any point, you know. I'm sure eventually, but I mean, I just feel like I just need to get there. <laughs> yeah. You know, I I I don't want to go too fast and you know no, overcommit and not and then fail. You know, I want to. Uh. <laughs> well, it sounds like you know yourself, so you gotta go. You gotta do what um, 
what feels right. Let's go to page um, 83 and look at the reading. Top of the page. Top. You want to read? Sure. Someone like me, someone born as a member of humankind, can tell what helps or hurts. Assuming that I never give up the Bodhisattva's way of life, why shouldn't I reach enlightenment? Okay, so can you continue reading the indented part? Sure. The state of Buddhahood is something that people of very great powers of intellect achieve only after applying... Oh, wait. I'm sorry. Okay. Can you go to page 84 okay. and read the indented part? I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> Bodhisattvas must, moreover, master the following way of thinking. Even those beings who are lions or tigers or dogs or wolves or vultures or cranes or crows or owls or worms or flies or bees or gnats can bring about the matchless state of enlightenment. And here I am, someone who is living the life of a human. Now, no matter what, even if it costs me my life, I will put forth whatever effort is needed to reach enlightenment. And um, so can you read um, Body the Indented part on page 85? Sure thing. I like what the commentary has to say <coughs> a lot. So rather than paraphrasing it, I'd rather just re you know underline what we've gone over. And then there is someone like me, someone born as a member of a kind of being which is truly extraordinary. I've been born human, and I possess as well an extraordinary mental ability. That is, I can tell what will, what will help or what will hurt me in my pursuit of the state of enlightenment. Assuming then that I never give up the Bodhisattva's way of life, which is to say, assuming that I can continue to practice the activities which Bodhisattvas do continually, why shouldn't I reach enlightenment? Of course I can. So, what is enlightenment? Who can tell me what it means? The end of suffering. Yeah. The permanent cessation of suffering. And then there's another part, a bonus part. I mentioned it a few times tonight. The wisdom end of that? Um, yeah, kind of, the, the omniscience. Right. That's what I was going for, which is you've got to be very wise to be omniscient. So that comes from what, wanting to help all living beings. and um, So that's what it means to be a Buddha. Um, you're always happy and you know everything. But um, a safer way to say it is that you're never unhappy and that you are very wise. Um, so how, how do we reach this state? How is it that we can reach this state? Um, the next thing we're going to go over is Buddha nature, which is how. So. Um, we all possess it, a Buddha nature. And the um, de definition of Buddha nature is very simple. That which can turn into a Buddha. And there's two main types. The first is innate Buddha nature. Which turns into the essence body of a Buddha. So it's the emptiness of our minds. Our minds are not inherently suffering.
you know, we can we can suffer. We can experience a headache as suffering. And um, we can also be very, very happy about something, you know, that's, that's happened or something we've done. Or, and so the emptiness of our minds is the fact that we have no inherent qualities of suffering or happiness in our minds. It has no inherent qualities. It's empty, and therefore, we can become a Buddha because we're not not a Buddha. Buddhism loves double negatives. And um, for the homework, Geshe Michael gives an example of this, and it's um, or an example. Um, actually, can you? Read the what homework question we're on now. Three. Three. Two. Three. 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 Can you read question three? Give, okay. the, give the definition of Buddha nature. Name the two main types and give one example of each. Okay. So the the example that he gives of a date Buddha nature is the emptiness of the mind of an old scroungy mutt. And I'm not sure why, but it what it is is it's a sentient being who's who's the emptiness of that being's mind. <coughs> so the second one is the Buddha nature that requires development. And that turns into the body of a Buddha. I'm sorry, it turns into the mind and body of a Buddha. I just wanted to check my... I just wanted to check my notes. And I should have had it two different ways sure this is the mind and body of a Buddha. Um, and the example that's given of the Buddha nature that requires development is the seed for a totally pure state of mind in the mental continuum of the same dog, same scroungy mutt. So um, Geshe Michael Roach debunks the idea that that you may have heard before that there's just a little tiny Buddha inside of us that's kind of obscured. We just need to remove the obscurations and and reveal it and um, that we're 
basically we're already enlightened, but we're just, it's just obscured. And um, he, I think the, the, the way he put it was that, um, are you happy all the time, like every minute? Because I'm not. Um, and, and how could there be a Buddha that was not happy? Um, and I know I personally don't know everything there is to know in the world. So how could there be an unwise Buddha? So that's how he, he debunks it, because Buddhas are never unhappy and omniscient, so I'm neither. And um, so I couldn't be a Buddha, even an obscure one. So, so we know our minds change, but we don't know much about that. So how do you think for a moment, how do you think about yourself? Like in general, how do you think about yourself? You mean reflexively, or Re when I'm really trying to think about it all the time when I'm but no, monitoring no. myself? Reflexively? Reflexively. What do you really think of yourself? I think I'm very self-existent. <laughs> Is that what you mean? I think I no. No, it was an open question. It was an open question. You know, think emptiness. And you did answer that way by saying your self-existent being. Well, um, some mornings do you just spring out of bed, happy and raring to go. And then some mornings do you just like barely drag your bum out of bed. Mm -hmm. So. Isn't that proof of emptiness? Because Did it change? Did it change? That well, it's well, it's change. It's it's proof that we're um, that we're not Buddhas yet. But it's proof of change, and it's proof that um, not one or the other. Hmm? We're not one or the other. We're not always up. We're not, we're always, not always up. We're not always down. Yes, we have mood swings. Hmm? We have mood swings. We have mood swings, <laughs> yes, <laughs> said the therapist. <laughs> <laughs> we can see ourselves as beautiful or handsome or a complete loser at times. You know? and, um, and that's because our mind is changing. I mean, I can look in the mirror at one point during a day and think, oh my god, my skin's all broke out, broken out, my hair looks frightful, and then go back later and my my mood has changed, my mind has changed, and I'm like, oh, I'm pretty good today. You know, all, all in the same afternoon that can happen. So that's proof of change to me. And if we were an inherently bad or ugly person, how could you wake up and feel wonderful and look in the mirror and see beauty sometimes? And vice versa, how could you wake up and see beauty if you sometimes are not so fond of you know, the, the appearance that you see gazing back at you in the mirror? So we can experience ourselves as a good person or a bad person. Um, and the experiences have causes. So, part of the bodhisattva activity is, is seeing yourself as a good person by doing good deeds. So, um, and in that process, if you habituate, habituate your mind that way, you will start to see yourself in a better light 
and feel better more of the time, most of the time about yourself. So, um, have have any of you tried that in going through this process? Because I know for some people, in trying to do all of this good stuff, they we just get mired in like, oh, I fucked up again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it sure did. <laughs> Excuse me. That I really have not done enough down the road that I wanted to do. That I really haven't made as much progress as I expect from myself. That I really, you know, and um, to that feeling that you've got so far to go. So far to go. And um, the question, am I ever going to make headway? Am I ever going to um, move along? And in, in, in telling ourselves those things, we're not helping. We need to be looking at the good things that we've done and moving those along and um, rehabituating that kind of thing. Because you can't have joyful effort when you're unhappy. And if you're unhappy about yourself and your behavior, um, that it's not good enough, then um, it's going to slow down the whole process. So practice happiness, happiness. That's what our prime directive from Lamaji is, to practice happiness. And in doing so, seeing yourself as the potential holy being that you are. So, um, it's almost obvious that when we help, help people, we feel good, and when we hurt people, we feel bad. It's, I mean, it's more obvious to some people than to others, and that takes practice to see that to um, kind of uncover that and realize that um, you um, are only kind of digging yourself in further to um, self-existent living if you're doing things that are going to um, hurt others, whereas when you're, you're you know, there's like an instant bang for your buck when you're doing the bodhisattva activities and you're helping other people. So the fact, um, the fact that our mind is not unhappy all the time is the mind's emptiness. And that's our Buddha nature. Mm -hmm. So. Um, the fact that we're not happy all the time or sad all the time, that's the emptiness of our mind. That's the first one, the innate Buddha nature. And then the second one is more your Buddha potential. And you're saying the seeds for a purely for a totally pure state of mind. <coughs> Just give me a second. Yeah, the first one is emptiness. Right. And the second one is the positive seed. So your potential, right? The potential. Okay. Yeah. So Buddha's minds are empty as well. They have no nature and are forced to see everything. Um, and including their minds as as great because they have so many good deeds, so much merit built up. It's not infinite though, because Buddhas continue to get to gather merit with do, doing Buddha activities, you know, helping us, emanating and so forth. So when we reach the point of enough merit that we've gathered, 
our minds will see our bodies and mind streams as good and perfect. And that's when we're enlightened. enlightened. Um, our mind's emptiness is that we have no fixed badness. So it's our lack of inherent badness, our non-virtue. And that's why we can become enlightened. And um, again, I'll say what Lamy Jesse said in the class I took, and that's we may not be enlightened, but we are not not enlightened. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. So can um, can you read question four? Give the definition of innate Buddha nature, which is what guarantees that we will become a Buddha. And explain why it provides us this guarantee. So I'll give you the definition. It's <coughs> that thing which is emptiness. And which will become the essence body of a Buddha. What is the essence body of a Buddha? Um, is that too big a question than a whole other class? <laughs> no, it's, it's not. Um, but it's, um, I'd rather, I'd rather answer it next week. Is that okay? Absolutely. Didn't we just define that? That's what I'm thinking. I mean, yeah. didn't we just answer that? Isn't that question the same as question three? <coughs> question main types. You said it's the same as question three? Well, it says well, the two main types, and the first type was innate, right? And yeah. you defined it just like you defined it. it. Yeah. No, it's what becomes the essence body of the Buddha. So, but it, my definition that I get turns into the essence body of the Buddha. That's the innate Buddha nature. Right, but then I wouldn't just because it turns into that when you become enlightened, it changes. So I'm not. I, I wouldn't. You know, equip. Um, right. I wouldn't make them equal. Equal's not the right word, but I wouldn't say that one, they define each other. Okay, the, the definition you just gave us for four is that which is emptiness and which will become the essence body of the Buddha. Right? That's mm -hmm. what you just said, I think. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. And then for question three, the innate Buddha nature turns in to the essence body of the Buddha, which is the same thing as becoming the essence body, right? Mm-hmm. But she asked me, what is the essence body? And we can know where it comes from, but I, do, I can't rattle off, off the top of my head what the essence body does. It's not the mnemonicaya, which is the, the emanation body. Um, I, it's I'm the emptiness not, body, isn't it? I believe so. It's the Dharmakaya. Dharmakaya, yeah. The emptiness body, the, um, the, the pure potential of what it could be. Okay, I'm going to check that. I'm sure Craig is right. But I wanna I wanna check it for next I'm week. I'm not so sure. <laughs> okay. Well no, it sounds real it sounds correct to me. So So I, I still don't understand the difference between the two the questions. The two questions. <laughs> it's okay, very so confusing. we don't huh? It is very confusing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just that maybe the the second one expand on it more. 
I, I don't have them in front of me, so I just want to look at them. You're t talking about questions three and four? That's so right. maybe question three was just the definition of Buddha nature is that it can turn into a Buddha, and the two main types are innate Buddha nature and Buddha nature that requires development. And then question four is asking for more detail on innate Buddha nature. But they're still very close. Why does it provide that guarantee? Maybe that's the new thing. Yeah, the rest of the answer is So the question is why does it guarantee that we will become a Buddha? That's because um, the fact that our minds have emptiness and are blank by nature um, that causes um, that is what causes extraordinary good karma or merit to let us see ourselves as Buddhas. That's what I had, and I kind of check mark on it. <laughs> that, are you talking about four? So extra I, merit. I was Spurring talking merit. about the second part of number. <coughs> oh, I'm looking at the quiz. That's why my numbers are wrong. Um, very yeah, I was talking about four. Okay. Just looking at the quiz, and the numbers are different. Sure. Oh wait, there was one more thing I wanted to see, say. Um, when we do see ourselves as omniscient in the future, that's our fu future Buddha selves. Geshe Michael tells this, um, has, he has said that he's made a practice of going, when he's in the bathroom stall, waving up and saying hi to his future Buddha self. <laughs> he's very cute when he said it too. Um, it's a ritual reminder of the goal and and the future. So. We won't ask why he's in the stall. What? We won't ask why he does it in that setting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why either. Privacy, I guess, of some sort. So, um, can you read on page 86, Fine. Yeah. Now, suppose you say, but I feel a fear for the act of having to give away my arms and legs and such, but it's nothing more than ignorance, a failure to judge what's really heavy or light that makes you afraid. Over count countless millions of eons, infinite times, your body's been sliced or stabbed or scorched with fire or chopped up into pieces, yet still you were not able then to reach enlightenment. So we died so many times before and giving up our body to death every time, we've gained nothing so far. So this the whole bodhisattva attitude, and when I say we've gained nothing, I mean toward our enlightenment. Um, so why not give up your body or parts of it toward our enlightenment? Um, but if you're not up for that yet, I'm certainly not up for that yet. I'm sticking with vegetables and maybe giving blood. Um, so I'm starting with that. So we're, this also, there's a reminder that our bodies are incredibly vulnerable. So we're always a little uncomfortable. Think about it. We're always physically just a little uncomfortable. <laughs> Oh, um, in fact, when I work with people, I try to give them maybe 20 minutes of not being uncomfortable, <laughs> and it doesn't always work, so when I'm doing massage. And a little pinprick or something, when, or a splinter, with, when infected, can completely go septic and kill us. So our body is flawed, which is unlike a Buddha's body. And we need to lose this body in order to get the Buddha body or rainbow body of light. So we have to give it up. So it's important to remember that too. So um, Janet, can you read on page 88? <coughs> the sufferings now that I must bear to reach enlightenment are something that has a limit. 
They're like the pain that one endures when a cut is made to stop some agony spreading in the chest. Every doctor as well makes use of treatments that cause discomfort to cure some greater illness. I should then learn to bear some minor hurt for the sake of bringing destruction upon a multitude of pains. So this is a verse to encourage us to stop whining about what we don't want to do. Master Shanti, Davis remi- Master Shanti Deva reminds us that it's difficult and bad things will happen on our way to enlightenment. You know, and there's schools of thought that the more you, more virtuous stuff you attempt to do, like get into a retreat, the more roadblocks you're going to run into. And I think some of us may have found that to be true. How hard sometimes it is to get into a retreat. You know, that things come up at work, or the car, or the family, or make it hard. Dogs. And dogs. <laughs> There's, oh yeah, no, I was kept out of retreat for 24 hours because my dog care fell through. But a Sangha member came to the rescue. So, yeah, dogs. So, the Diamond Cutter Sutra states that you will suffer if you study it because it's such a sacred text. But the commentary states also um, that you'll suffer less in the long run if you do study it. Meaning, the bad karma that comes up and presents itself to to, um, afflict you while you're studying it is going to be much less impactful than the, the karma that will come up if you haven't studied it. So... Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so one studying emptiness is a way to force through the bad karma more quickly. Um, one way to get rid of your bad karma is to actually experience it, and the sooner the better because it it does grow. So. My apologies to you, but it's better to have a migraine, migraines for a year than to have eons in hell, in the hell realms. So, you know, you stub your toe, you get into an accident, <coughs> fender bender, or something, and you think, oh great, I'm purifying. <laughs> You're burning off bad karma when that happens. So, um, that is what purification is is burning off the bad karma. If you don't recreate the bad karma in turn, then you're cleansing um, your karmic bank account. So that's the important part too, is to not recreate the bad karma. So um, this example about cutting something um, to make, you know, in the body, to make something stop that's going to really hurt you or be painful or kill you um, it is, you know, it's underlined by the invasive medical procedures that we'll under, undergo in order to avoid worse medical things that you sit on cold metal tables, you get into little jo- johnnies and get poked with needles and prodded and um, it's all in the name of better health to avoid um, greater suffering. So, you know, colonoscopy, anyone? <laughs> anyone want one of those? Or just doing the practice fun. So how is this different? This, um, bodhisattva acti- activity of um, really giving yourself to another person. So why shouldn't we be um, happy to endure these pains and inconveniences if it's going to get us to enlightenment? Um, So, 
I was going to read a little bit on page 89. Consider the difference between the sufferings of the three lower realms and the sufferings that I must now bear to reach enlightenment. Compared to the former, the latter are something that has a limit. That is, they are relatively brief and in insignificant and quite easy to bear. They are like the pain that one is able to endure when a small cut is made on the body in order to stop the agony of some dangerous illness which is beginning to spread inside the chest. And here is the third part. Every doctor there is makes use as well of treatments that cause some minor bit of discomfort in order to cure some greater illness. The pains which I may experience with the hardships that I undertake for the sake of achieving enlightenment are very minor. I should then, meaning therefore, learn to bear with the minor hurt involved in these hardships, performed as they are for the sake of bringing destruction upon the multitude of pains found here in the circle of suffering life. The whole reason for me to endure these pains is that I am going to extinguish the suffering that I myself and others as well must endure over a limitless period of time. So, um, we we'll move on to question five. <coughs> There's no question. And that one is, can you read that? Relate the reasoning that Master Shanti Devi uses to establish that it is unreasonable for us to fear even very great sacrifices, such as cutting off our arms or legs in our search for enlightenment. So this is, um, does anyone want to take a, Take a crack at this one. Is it because because I liked this part the best of this whole chapter? This is that I think that that we're not asked to do it until we're ready to do it. That we there's no reason to fear it because it's not something you have to do until you reach the point where you no longer fear doing it. Um. Is it also that you get more merit from focusing on goodness and happiness, enjoying good deeds joyfully, rather than enjoying things like cutting off our arms and legs, which are more negative? Um, kind of. The, the reasoning that I took from it is that we've spent, e spent eons already in the lower three realms. So our sacrifices um, and efforts as a bodhisattva are nothing compared to them, th those sufferings that will bring us quickly to the path of enlightenment. So it's more of a comparison to where we've reached at this point to be a bodhisattva or aspiring to be a bodhisattva in this human life. We're We've, we've come so far and the, the, that the um, things that we're asked to undergo in this human life are so minor compared to the, um, the lives we spent in um, the um, hell realms, the animal realm, and the Prater, or craving spirit realm. So it's much better than continuing on to those realms much better to in this human life to um, bear the um, the pains and sufferings because it'll get us somewhere it's not just um, you know doing the right thing is going to bring us to enlightenment and doing the wrong thing is going to bring us to the hell realms so that's that's his basic reasoning what's the bigger fear What's the bigger fear? Yeah, that's a <coughs> rhetorical question. <coughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's also hard to imagine cutting off your arms and that's joyful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, Lama Jesse tells a story about a bodhisattva, I was going to tell it later, who um, he's walking on the road and um, 
a guy comes up to him and says, can I have your eye? I need your eye. Can I have it? And the bodhisattva, such a big old bodhisattva that he reaches in his eye socket and he pulls out his eye and he says, here, and he gives it to the guy. And the guy takes it, throws it on the ground and stomps on it. And um, at that point, you know, the, the bodhisattva can go one of two ways. He can lose his bodhicitta out of uh, uh, upset over this incident, meaning that he didn't really let go of, of that part of his body. He had an agenda for what the guy was going to do with it. I don't know what the agenda would be. Or he could, if the man asked him, I need the other eye, can I have it? He could take it out and give it to him, regardless of what he was going to do with it. Of course, a blind bodhisattva won't be not a good thing, but um, it's, it's more along the lines of how when, you're, when you've reached the point where you can do these things, you could even give away your eye. And um, in order to do so, to know that you're ready, you need to know that you wouldn't then become upset if, if the person completely dis, 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 um, respected or trashed your offering so that you'd be just happy to have helped them in their moment of need. So, um, it begs a question, though. Yeah. Um, a bodhisattva is supposed to do what is best for the other person. Mm -hmm. And the other person has taken his offering and done something very <coughs> negative with it, and therefore caused himself much negative karma. So the bodhisattva would probably not give him the second eye if he knew that he was well, going to That's a good point. It. For that's a very set. good point. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's a really good point. Thank you. Um, I, I'm uh, having a hard time remembering what Mama Jessie said about the second eye, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll listen to that. So, um, Janet, can you I think that is exactly what he said. Call. I remember hearing Do you? story, and I think what Craig said is for the sake of the guy, he wouldn't, because mm -hmm. that wouldn't be good karma for that guy. Yeah, and it's also the higher thing that he could do. Would he, with one eye, would he be able to serve more people right. than if he was blind <coughs> and would need somebody to serve him, too? But yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, can you read question six, Janet? We have another argument for it and then one against people like ourselves trying to perform extreme bodhisattva acts, like giving away our arms and legs at this point in our spiritual development. So the Master Shanti David talks about the great physician using what are gen generally gentle means to remove our suffering. Um, so um, this is, you know, would be like if you were going to have your gallbladder removed because you're having gallstones. And, um, you know, it's gentler to go in arthroscopically and to remove it, then it would be to let you have the gallstone attack, which is pretty horrible, I hear. Um, so the surgery is worth the pain for the outcome of relief, just as our bodhisattva activities will release us from the suffering cycle um, through the collection of merit and wisdom. So. Um, We're cautioned, however, um, to do what we're capable of in the moment and don't overreach our abilities because it will have a negative impact if 
you know, you you want to take back whatever you did. Um, eventually, we'll be able to give us the scripture says we'll be able to give our own bodies, like our arms and our legs, and in time, and we practice, they won't be difficult. And it's extremely hard to imagine that, but this is about extreme um, renunciation from, you know, this world and even our own body. That's more what it's about, is, is that we're thinking about what's next more than this life and um, doing the right thing for them and knowing that we're going to lose our bodies eventually. So what's the big deal? Um, Kit Bonnie, can you read on page 91? There comes a point where we reach a state of mind where we can do our bodies just like the vegetables. At that stage, then, why is it that we would feel it difficult at all to offer our flesh for the rest? Okay. So, um, the reading further goes on to say that we should consider the hardships <coughs> that one must undertake to achieve enlightenment. The supreme physician, the lord of the able ones, the Buddha, does not perform these treatments of his in a way that's like those other ordinary ones that are used to cure some illnesses. Rather, he uses a particular kind of technique or method that's gentle in the extreme, a blissful path to reach a blissful goal. It is a path which avoids both extremes. It is neither neither leaves one spent and exhausted, nor leads to the thoughtless consumption of resources. He uses it to cure the massive and infinite ills of the mental afflictions, which force us to continue wandering in the circle of suffering. It could never be right then for you to fear these spiritual hardships. So this is what, um, you know, I mentioned last week about, and it was mentioned in the, um, the scripture, to start off slow with vegetables. So, um, with giving, for instance, in order to be able to manage joyful effort in giving, um, we have to give within our means, no matter how meager. Um, and this doesn't just refer to financial means. Because there's, there's many people who don't give out of fear of want, no matter how abundant their lives are. So, you know, it's the fear that you've got to overcome. I mean, some of us have got to worry about want because that's just what's in, within our budgets. But um, the, it's the fears that get us that... that um, the, you know, the psychological sources of our limitations, um, but it really does boil down to karma. So we work um, on exercising those giving muscles and the ethical muscles and the patience muscles and the meditative muscles, if you will. So um, we start small, but you need to think big. So think of yourself as generous. Think of yourself as um, joyfully generous. So, a way to help do this is Lama G's couch potato contemplation to come home from work and sit on the couch or the lazy boy or the barca lounger as he calls it and think about how good things are. Um, think about what's positive in your world, what good happened that day, what happy thing um, may have happened to you or you may have brought to someone else. So um, so how many people are doing couch potato contemplation? You are? I'm yeah. I'm not every day. I'm not good at that one, but how about morning law? Morning law. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to 
trying to do that every day, but my mind wanders terribly while I do it. So, um, well, they're both great practices, very beautiful. So, and they both help us realize how good we have it in this precious human life, which is important to remember. Gratitude is very powerful. And um, and you can make yourself a much happier person by being um, grateful. So, and to and we'll just hit all the high points, the book practice, people keeping books at all. No? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, it's a really good practice because you can, even if you're just writing down one thing a day, or you're you're keeping track of all the times you felt happy or grateful during the day, or um, anything like that, you, you can modify it to however you want it. I mean, I like, the, the, what I do is I do the, the six times a day, but you can also add things in or subtract things, and um, it's just really good to stop, you know, six times a day and write down briefly um, what's going on and where you're at. Because it, it's, you know, it's a mindfulness practice. It's a lovely mindfulness practice. So, um, so back to the, the, the Buddha's medicine. Um, medical treatments can kill us. Many, many different kinds can kill us, whether it's surgery or chemo or anything like that. Um, so the pre prescriptions that the Buddha wrote for us, writes for us, are much, much gentler. So be kind, even if it's a hardship. Be kind to others. And be reasonable. Ignorance really contributes to the confusion in our life. And be realistic. Be realistic about what you can do. If you are on the street and you see a homeless person and you can only um, give a quarter, you can't give a dollar, just give them the quarter. And then if you want to up the quarter, you can just stand and talk with them. You know, because it's Homelessness is very isolating, so I mean it's just a suggestion, but um, and it's it's not easy to do. A lot of people just put the money in so they don't have to look at the person. Um, eventually, you'll get to up to a kidney or something. <laughs> <laughs> I just got another letter from the organ donor um, organization that I signed up with. And I, I, it's funny that this comes up today because I didn't think of it while I was, because I was in the middle of preparing and I took my mail and I opened it and I was like, oh, do I really want to sign back up because it's a changing, something's changing, who's administering it? And they gave me a thing to fill out and send back. And I'm going to go home and fill it out and send it back. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, That's easy for me to do, because that would be something where I, you know, I'd be done with my body. So at least I can do that. Um, <clears throat> so um, there's a guy. There's a guy in a cab in New York. And these two tourists with their cameras and their hats, matching hats, and their I Love New York t-shirts come up to him and say, how do you get to Broadway? And he says what any good cab driver in New York would say, practice, practice, practice. So it's the same with getting to enlightenment. It's a bad joke, I know. <laughs> practice, practice, practice. 
What would you say? It's Carnegie Hall. It's Carnegie Hall? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Broadway <I> worked. <laughs> <laughs> Broadway doesn't make any difference. Doesn't make any difference. <laughs> In my version, it's Broadway. <laughs> that's right. You still have to practice. I forgot that. No, that's how yeah, I heard it. You still have to practice, too. Yeah. All right. Um, so the meditation's the same. Again. <laughs> it is. Oh. Yep. All right. Well, you better be getting to that route soon. <laughs> It's an, it's an emptiness meditation. It's Working on, meditation. what is it, 4,000 4, hours of Oh, somewhere in there. 4,000 hours of 4,000 teachings. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So again, if you're taking it for credit, I'd like you to do the meditation at least three days a week and then sit, whether you're doing other meditations or whatever, try to do sit for another two, two or three days during the week. So, any questions on the homework or anything? All right. So, if you want to take a minute to dedicate, you might want to dedicate it to someone who's having an especially hard time right now. You know, maybe somebody who's having a hard time habituating what they know they should do as a bodhisattva. And it can be yourself. <laughs> If you're struggling and give the merit to, to that person or to yourself um, to help you to help you or them along the way of developing that bodhisattva consciousness of bodhicitta always. So Craig, you want to say prayers in English? <coughs> Air is a great earth. Build the mountains and cover them with blanket of flowers. The great mountain, the four continents, wearing the jewel of the sun and moon. In my mind, I make them the paradise of a Buddha and offer them all to you. By this deed, may every living being experience the pure world. Idam Gurura Namandaka Nimitayani. By the goodness of what I have just done, may all beings complete the collection of merit and wisdom, and thus gain the two worlds. Sarva Mangal, May all beings complete the collection of merit and wisdom and thus gain the two worlds. Sarva Mangal, please teach. Please teach. Please teach. Please stay. Thank you. Craig, can you edit that out? <laughs> that really surprised me. What? Did you turn it off yet? I saw your breath, but then the cord was right there. <laughs> I can't edit it on this one. Miss Lizzie, can I take that point and cut us a little down? Um...